The roar of the engines, the leather jackets, and the sense of brotherhood, the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club is known for its notorious reputation. But behind the scenes, many members have been accused of heinous crimes, including drug dealing, trafficking in stolen goods, gun running, extortion, and prostitution operations. How do the Hells Angels react to their fate as the gavel falls and sentences are handed down? We will look at some of the most high-profile cases and sentences involving Hells Angels members and explore their reactions to their sentences. This is the Hells Angels brush with justice. Caius Veovis, known for his unusual appearance and purported ties to Satanism, received three consecutive life terms for a chilling crime spree in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. At 34, Veovis, who often identified as a self-proclaimed vampire and Satanist, was convicted of kidnapping, killing, and dismembering three men. His unique look, including forehead implants that looked like horns, green tattoos on his fingertips showing the bone structure beneath, and the number 666 marked above his eyebrows, heightened the intrigue around his case. These eerie features drew focus to Veovis, implicated in the crimes against David Glasser, Edward Frampton, and Robert Chadwell. The victims' dismembered remains were found buried near Pittsfield, 10 days post their 2011 disappearance. The prosecution contended that Veovis, together with Adam Lee Hall and David Chalou, masterminded the sinister deeds. Glasser, due to testify against Hall, a Hells Angels member, was murdered to silence him. And these were the opening words of his lawyer. The Commonwealth has never been able to find the scene of these killers, and therefore I expect there will be no evidence or testimony connecting Mr. Veovis to the location or locations where these crimes occurred. The other two victims were reportedly killed to ensure no witnesses to Glasser's murder remained. Despite mounting evidence against him, Veovis persistently claimed his innocence throughout the trial. The trial, relocated to Hampton County Superior Court in Springfield, Massachusetts, sought a neutral jury given the case's widespread attention. As jurors departed the courthouse following their deliberations, a defiant Veovis exclaimed, I'll see you all in hell. Yeah, I'll see you all in hell. Do you remember that? Every one of you, I'll see you in hell. After deliberating for 37 hours over six days, the jury rendered their verdict. Veovis received a life sentence without the possibility of parole for first-degree murder, along with convictions for kidnapping and witness intimidation. Before his role in the gruesome crime, Caius Veovis was already under the media spotlight. In 1999, he and his then-girlfriend, Deanne Jones, drew public attention after being accused of assaulting a 16-year-old girl. The couple allegedly enticed the girl into their hotel room, where Jones used a razor blade to harm her back. Subsequently, they engaged in alarming acts using the victim's blood. During this period, Veovis identified as both a Satan worshiper and a vampire, revealing his affinity for blood. In 2006, he faced accusations of kidnapping and drug possession tied to an episode with two strippers. While the kidnapping charges were later dismissed, a probation breach landed him in a main prison once known as Roy Gutfinski Jr. He legally adopted the name Caius Veovis in 2008. The rationale behind this decision remains a mystery. His chosen name blends references, Caius from the Twilight series, a vampire, and Veovis, a Roman deity linked with hellish escapes. As Veovis is sentenced to prison, the victim's family can finally sense that the long-awaited sense of closure is drawing near. Really, I'm glad it's all over. Like justice is served, even though we'll never get them back. To help to bring some type of closure, I don't know how much we're ex we're gonna get, but it's a start for something. But we are not sure that justice is indeed served as Veovis plans to appeal the case. But the terror continues. The next scene was set for Adam Lee Hall's reckoning in the Hampton Superior Court in Massachusetts, a man whose name would forever be associated with a horrific catastrophe. Hall was convicted of the savage murder of three men and sentenced to three consecutive life terms, demonstrating the gravity of his actions. Hall, along with his co-conspirators David Chalou and Caius Viovis, faced three counts of first-degree murder and kidnapping. Their heinous actions were revealed in 2014 when the three were found guilty of planning a merciless spree that took the lives of David Glasser, Edward Frampton, and Robert Chadwell. 
The terrifying events took place in Pittsfield, where the victims met their untimely deaths. Their remains were brutally dissected after being shot, then placed in plastic bags and transferred in Hall's truck. Their bones were buried in an unmarked grave in a secluded part of Beckett by their killers. The horrible crime, which occurred on the night of August 27, 2011, went unnoticed until authorities discovered the mangled bodies 13 days later. As the trial began, witnesses were put to the stand, revealing a sequence of macabre revelations that presented a terrible portrayal of Hall and his co-conspirators. An ex-girlfriend revealed Hall's possession of weapons on the night of the murders, concealed beneath a bag of dog food as one of the horrifying statements. The frightening act was carried out in order to prevent the victims from testifying in an unrelated case, throwing an even darker shadow on the crime. Rose Dawson, another witness, offered insight into Hall's behavior following the murders, revealing how he attempted to hide the signs of his crime by washing his automobile. Despite the revelations, the trial was fraught with legal fighting. The defense attempted to undercut Dawson's credibility by exposing her suspected drug use in the past. But even with this, Judge Jeffrey Kinder did not back down as he had this to say. The evidence in this case revealed a level of depravity and disregard for human dignity beyond my experience. This case gained significant media focus primarily due to the infamous reputation of the Hells Angels. This attention was so intense that the trial had to be moved from Berkshire County to Springfield. During the trial, Hall's legal team contended that he was innocent and that he was singled out solely because of his association with the Hells Angels. However, the jury didn't accept this argument, as shown by their verdict. And back in He was not found guilty of kidnapping, but that did not mean he would go free. Rather, he was sentenced to three life sentences charged with first-degree murder, which brought some peace to some of the victim's families, particularly Robert Chadwell's sister. Definitely, there's something that's never going to be filled. Mm -hmm. I mean, because there are questions that I have that only he can answer, you know what I mean? And he's not going to do that, just like he never apologized because he's not sorry for what he did. Let's take a trip to Rhode Island where we delve into the intriguing case of Joseph Lincia, the head honcho of the Hell's Angel gang in the area. Back in 2019, things took a wild turn when Lincia found himself facing a laundry list of charges. These included some serious allegations like attempted murder, brandishing a dangerous weapon, firing a gun during a violent crime, and even carrying a concealed pistol without the proper paperwork. What sparked this legal frenzy? Well, it all goes back to a shooting incident in 2019 and a brawl in 2020, both connected to a strip club in Providence. The saga kicked off when Lindsay took aim at an unknown target from a bustling sidewalk. Armed with a .25 caliber semi-automatic handgun, he fired a single shot at a truck passing by the clubhouse on Wendell Street. The startled truck driver, Richard Starnino, managed to speed away, but not before the bullet left its mark on the truck's passenger door. Lindsay, seemingly unaffected, went back into the clubhouse. Cue the Rhode Island State Police tactical team, who rolled in to investigate the shooting. Their search warrant led them to the Messer Street clubhouse, where they struck gold. Three handguns, assorted ammunition, and that pesky .25 caliber bullet were among the finds. By this time, Lindsay's escapade seemed to be catching up with him. Temporarily released on bail, Lindsay's legal deeds were far from over. The year 2020 brought yet another rowdy incident at a clubhouse, which promptly shattered the terms of his 2019 bail. It's clear that Lindsay's roller coaster with the law was far from a straightforward ride. Duty member of the, Club Security and the, face. the defendant's lawyer argued that the person the defendant attacked was a known criminal who had a criminal record. 
it's presumed innocent and has an unblemished criminal record. The lawyer also stated that the victim had threatened members of the Hells Angels motorcycle group. Hells Angel members, all of them, were in high alert at this point, knowing his history to carry firearms. Which had put the members on high alert due to the victim's past involvement with firearms. Despite these arguments, the court was not convinced and decided to hold the defendant without bail. The court believed that releasing the defendant on bail would not ensure that he would follow any conditions set for his release. The court's not satisfied that if he is were to be released on bail, that he is going to abide by any terms and conditions um, that were placed on him. In 2022, Joseph Lancia, the defendant, asked Judge Kirsten E. Rogers, who was overseeing his case, to step down because her husband was a lieutenant in the Rhode Island police. However, the judge did not recuse herself from the case, as there wasn't enough evidence to suggest bias. Before the judge made her final ruling, Lancia pleaded no contest to the charges against him. He believed that he might receive a harsher sentence if the case went to trial. As a result, he accepted a plea deal that led to a five-year prison sentence to be served at the Adult Correctional Institutions, ACI. A five-year full sentence, all of which is to be served at the ACI. Lancia also received 15 years in total, with five years in prison and 10 years on probation for different charges related to the case. A no-contact order was imposed between Lancia and the victim, Richard Starnino, for eight years. Lancia was also required to pay $3,650 in restitution. During the sentencing, Lancia chose not to address the court and maintained a stoic expression, showing little emotion. The judge gave him an opportunity to speak but received no response from Lancia. Our focus shifts to David Shalhoub, a key figure in the trio that also includes Caius Viovis and Adam Lee Hall. All three played roles in a notorious murder case. Shalou, at 47 from North Adams, faced accusations related to the abduction and murder of three men. He emerged as the second defendant in the unsettling 2011 triple homicide that captivated many due to its macabre details. The remains of three Pittsfield residents, David Glasser, Robert Chadwell, and Edward Frampton, were found in Beckett in August 2011. Investigations showed the victims had been kidnapped, shot, and horrifically mutilated. Prosecutors contended that Shalu, among the trio, played a part in these gruesome killings. Shalu, however, staunchly refuted these murder allegations and other associated charges. A pivotal witness, David Casey, offered a chilling account, detailing how Shalu with Hall brutally dismembered the victims, severing their limbs and heads. One among the accused even boasted of sleeping peacefully after such heinous deeds. Shalu's defense lawyer countered the prosecution's case by arguing that the witnesses who testified against Shalu were jailhouse informants, making their reliability questionable. According to prosecutors, Hall, the primary suspect, desired Glasser's death to prevent him from testifying against Hall in a separate case. The other victims, prosecutors contended, were killed to eliminate potential witnesses. During the trial, Berkshire District Attorney David Kaplis recommended that the accused receive three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. This recommendation was endorsed by Hampton Superior Court Judge C. Jeffrey Kinder. Kinder noted that each victim's life deserved acknowledgement and stressed that the term heinous was an understatement for the defendant's actions. He highlighted the depraved nature of the victim's deaths and Shalu's targeting of the disabled, as well as his manipulation of young women Kinder emphasized his willingness to impose the most severe sentence available within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Kaplis echoed these sentiments, urging the court not to show mercy to the accused, as Shalu had shown none to the victims. After extensive deliberations, the jury finally delivered their verdict. As the judge read the verdict, Shalu's indifference was evident. He received three life sentences for his crimes. However, Shalu was undeterred, and took his case to the Supreme Court in an attempt to have his sentence overturned. He appealed his conviction, alleging multiple errors from the initial trial that had influenced the outcome. Regrettably for Shalou, the Supreme Court rejected his appeal, affirming that the first-degree murder verdicts were in alignment with justice. During the appeal, Shalou's legal team contended that several mistakes had been made during the original trial that had impacted the outcome. 
These included issues related to the admission of weapon-related evidence and forensic testimony. Shalou's lawyer argued that improper jury instructions, the introduction of prejudicial character evidence, and the dismissal of certain arguments from the prosecution had all tainted the trial's fairness. With regards to the photos of the weapons, this court found error in both the Viovis and Hall decisions with the court's admission of the evidence of the studded baseball bat. Um, that evidence was admitted here, but unlike in the cases of Viovis and Hall, the forensic testimony here was not the same. Moreover, Shalou's appeal raised concerns about inappropriate statements made by the prosecution during opening and closing arguments. The court thoroughly reviewed the 2013 trial proceedings and ultimately concluded that there were no valid grounds to overturn the convictions or reduce the imposed sentences. Our next look will be the arrest of Richard DeVries, the alleged Las Vegas Hells Angels president, which was made on criminal counts, including racketeering, in October 2020. This shocking discovery was discovered during a court proceeding, which resulted in DeVries' arrest and subsequent legal actions. The case was based on a complicated web of alleged gang-related violence and criminal activity in the previous months. A violent event that occurred in May of the same year led to the indictment of DeVries and seven other people on racketeering charges. Six members of the Vagos Motorcycle Organization were hurt in this event, which entailed a shooting on Henderson Highway. We know that a month back, um, about a month ago in San Bernardino, a Vago still did kill a Hell Hell's Angel. Serious claims against them included conspiracy to commit murder, attempted murder, battery, and firing a gun into an occupied building. The additions related to supporting or assisting a criminal gang make these allegations considerably more serious. The prosecution claimed that DeVries and other Hells Angels were accountable for the shooting event. The attack's suspected motivation was thought to be retaliation for a prior shooting in San Bernardino that had killed a Hells Angels motorcycle rider. Nevertheless, during a grand jury session, a Vagos group member disputed this claim. It became clear throughout the court proceedings that the event had taken place during a ride that included motorcycles from the Hells Angels and the Vagos. Video footage depicting Hells Angels members in the vicinity of the shooting was among the evidence shown to the jury. Important video evidence was released by an unnamed witness showing three guys who may have been Hells Angels members approaching the Vagos gang just before the shooting started. However, it was unclear how the shooting actually happened and whose groups were involved. The severity of the exchange is shown by the number of shell casings that have been left dispersed along the highway for more than a mile after the shooting. Although some people had gunshot wounds, it was not known if the Vagos group had also fired gunfire. As a result, two people developed critical conditions and needed to be hospitalized. The court hearings provided information about the alleged years-long operations of the Las Vegas Hells Angels chapter as a criminal organization. Richard DeVries, according to the prosecution, was instrumental in overseeing, funding, and managing the group. I believe that there is clear and convincing evidence that, uh, that all of these, these defendants are a danger to the community. Additionally, he was charged with encouraging violence against members of competing motorcycle gangs, such as the Vagos, in order to elevate his position within the Hells Angels hierarchy. The defense provided a viewpoint that refuted the prosecution's assertions throughout the court proceedings. According to the defense, Nevada law had not classified the Hells Angels Motorcycle Organization as a criminal group. Angels Motorcycle Club has not been found by a jury in the state of Nevada to be a criminal gang. Judge Tierra Jones rejected a request to recall DeVries' arrest warrant notwithstanding this argument. DeVries was subsequently arrested and his bail was set at $250,000. The atmosphere remained tense as the court case went on. Like his fellow Hells Angels, DeVries showed little emotion throughout the process. The ambiguity surrounding his release on bail increased the gravity of the situation. There was no doubt that the verdicts in these cases could have an effect on how the Hells Angels and motorcycle clubs are viewed in the city. In the upcoming case, we turn our attention to the trial of Jay Witt, who is facing charges of second-degree murder and the use of a firearm in the commission of a felony. 
Witt's legal battle revolves around his alleged involvement in the death of William Furlong, whose lifeless body was discovered at the Hells Angels Motorcycle Clubhouse in July 2013. This trial promises to unravel the events leading up to this tragic incident and determine Witt's culpability. Crucial evidence, including surveillance footage from the Hells Angels Motorcycle Clubhouse, has emerged as a key player in shedding light on the unfolding events. The footage captures Witt entering the clubhouse accompanied by his girlfriend. Later, he is seen leaving the premises with a plastic bag in hand. Notably, Witt is observed meticulously wiping down door handles and doors before departing. Meanwhile, Witt's girlfriend, Tammy Kozak, is facing her own set of charges, including being an accessory and tampering with evidence. Presently, Kozak is in custody as the legal proceedings continue. During the investigation, Kozak revealed chilling details from the night in question. She recounted how Wit had awakened her, claiming to have engaged in a confrontation with someone. Shockingly, he then divulged to her that a lifeless body awaited discovery downstairs. Witt's eventual apprehension, occurring almost two weeks after the issuance of an arrest warrant, further adds to the intrigue surrounding the case. Leading the prosecution is Matt Cuss, who has presented a compelling case against Witt. The prosecution asserts that a confrontation had taken place between Witt and Furlong prior to the fatal incident. Cuss has vehemently pushed for the maximum sentence for manslaughter. He has underscored the importance of not pigeonholing the case as merely involving the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, emphasizing Furlong's identity as a devoted family man and father. Testifying during the trial, Sergeant Roche Jenkins of the Omaha Police Department described the grim discovery of Furlong's body. Furlong was found lifeless, wedged between a couch and a bar within the clubhouse. A witness present on the night of the incident has come forward, alleging that Witt murdered Furlong following an altercation and coercing her into aiding in the removal of evidence. As the trial transitioned to its sentencing phase, Cuss disclosed a chilling revelation. Furlong had suffered three gunshot wounds. Investigators suspected that Witt had attempted to stage the crime scene to resemble a break-in orchestrated by a rival motorcycle club casting a shadow of doubt on the true sequence of events. However, when given the opportunity to speak, Witt chose silence. Instead, his legal representative, Daniel Stockman, addressed the court. Stockman disclosed that Witt possessed the potential to provide a compelling argument for self-defense. Stockman contended that the looming threat of habitual criminal sentencing compelled Witt to accept a plea bargain. He argued that the evidence presented could, at most, substantiate a charge of manslaughter and potentially even support a case for self-defense. During this phase of the trial, Don Furlong, the bereaved wife, stepped onto the stand, appealing to Judge Lee Ann Reddelsdorf. She implored the judge to view her husband's character beyond his affiliation with the motorcycle club. She passionately depicted her husband as a loving family man who had been a pillar of support and stability. Her emotional appeal aimed to counteract any preconceived notions based on stereotypes or appearances. In the culmination of this legal saga, Jay Witt received a sentence totaling 20 years for manslaughter, an additional 10 to 20 years for using a firearm during a felony, and a range of 3 to 10 years for possessing a firearm as a felon. This sentencing was the result of a plea agreement Witt reached with the Douglas County Attorney's Office which played a pivotal role in averting the possibility of harsher sentencing due to a habitual criminal charge. With this sentence, the chapter closes on a tragic narrative encompassing life, death, and the intricate facets of justice. So what do you think about their crimes? Do their reactions make you feel anything? Let us know in the comment section below. And don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button for more content. See you in the next one. Yves Trudeau is a name that struck fear into the hearts of many. He was a Canadian outlaw biker, mobster, and contract killer. He was born on February 4, 1946 and died in July 2008. He was also known as Apache and the Mad Bomber. Trudeau was the Hells Angels' main assassin in several motorcycle wars throughout Canadian history. After the Lennoxville Massacre, he turned himself in as a witness for the prosecution because he was fed up with his cocaine addiction and had a sneaking hunch that his fellow gang members wanted him dead. 
But how did Yves Trudeau become Canada's worst serial killer? The years 1936 to 1960 are known as the Grande Noirceur, or the Great Darkness in Quebec history. During this period, the ultra-conservative Catholic Union Nationale Party held the majority of power in Quebec and dominated the province. Beginning with the provincial election in 1960, in which the Quebec Liberals soundly defeated the Union Nationale, Quebec society underwent profound shifts that came to be known as the Quiet Revolution. As a result of these changes, like you would expect in places with strict rules, Quebec went from being one of the most conservative societies in North America to being one of the most liberal societies in the span of a decade. The Quebecois embraced a culture of hedonism in the 1960s as part of a backlash against the medieval Catholic social mores of the Grande Noirceur. As a result, Quebec got a substantially higher percentage of illegitimate births and drug usage than English Canada. Outlaw motorcycle clubs became very popular in Quebec in the 1960s as part of the same backlash against the suffocating conformism of the Grand Noirceur. Many French-Canadian young men saw the outlaw biker culture as a symbol of freedom, rebellion, and machismo, and by 1968, the beautiful province had 350 outlaw motorcycle clubs. Ironic, isn't it? There was a level of violence and viciousness between the various biker groups in Quebec that was unparalleled compared to the rest of Canada. This is what you get when too many clubs are seeking their share of the organized crime rackets, giving Quebec the reputation of being the red zone in the world of outlaw motorcycle clubs. The Popeye Moto Club in Quebec, which was managed by Yves Trudeau and later evolved into the first Hells Angels chapter in Canada, was the first motorcycle club. This was the most notorious group, which brought the Hells Angels' attention to their outlaw biker club in Quebec. The Montreal Mafia frequently contracted the Popeyes to carry out assassinations on their behalf. In September of 1979, the national president of the Hells Angels, Yves Le Boss Buteau, divided the Hells Angels Montreal chapter into two separate groups, a North chapter based in Laval and managed by Laurent Langlais Vio and a South chapter based in Sorel Tracy and led by Réjean Zig Zig Lessard. The Montreal chapter had an excessive number of members, and the clubhouse was starting to feel claustrophobic as a result. You can imagine what takes place when a bunch of jacked-up bearded guys meet in one place with booze. It must have been hell. The North chapter became notorious for its violent and irresponsible behavior and its heavy drugs usage. In stark contrast to the Montreal South chapter led by Lassard, which was comprised of guys who joined the Angels after 1977 and were more disciplined, the North chapter in Montreal included primarily of males who had previously been members of the Popeyes and still maintained popey views. Following the Outlaws' assassination of Buteau on September 8, 1983, by the Outlaws, Michel Sky Langlois, the new national president of the Hells Angels, emphasized growing the organization's presence in other provinces. Because Buteau was no longer in the picture, Viao developed a more open-minded and laid-back perspective on issues pertaining to drug usage and acts of violence. The Laval chapter, which Trudeau was part of, which had previously frequently chafed at Buteau's restrictions, became completely out of control while Viao was in charge. Now this is where Trudeau became really dark, Trudeau was just an ordinary biker, or seemed like one. He was only 5 feet 6 inches tall, weighed 135 pounds, and had short hair and a clean shave. Despite this, he is regarded as the most prolific killer in the Hells Angels club. Nobody would have guessed he was the club's enforcer and primary weapon because other angels weighed between 300 and 400 pounds, had an average height of 6 feet, and had long hair and beards. It is said that Trudeau was the first Canadian Hell's Angel to acquire the Filthy Few patch, which is given to club members who have murdered in the name of the organization. Trudeau was responsible for the deaths of 18 of the 23 outlaws that were killed during the Biker War between 1978 and 1983, and pitted the Hell's Angels against the outlaws for dominance of the drug trade in Montreal. He was a psychopathic killer and a killing machine, he was the most dangerous killer in the club. People believed that he had absolutely no conscience 
and he had no respect for human life at all. Kind of like a vampire, continuously hungry for blood. In 1985, Trudeau claimed that West End gang boss Frank Ryan's replacement, Alan Ross, also known as The Weasel, had promised him $200,000 to destroy Frank Ryan's killers and had been given $25,000 in advance. When Trudeau tried to collect the remaining $200,000 after killing April and Lely Evra, Ross told him that he should go collect the money from the Halifax and Sorrel chapters of the Hells Angels, who owned the West End gang drug debts. David Carroll, who is the president of the Hells Angels chapter in Halifax, gave Trudeau $98,000. Carroll then learned that the Laval chapter was, in fact, entitled to one quarter of the money and that Trudeau had used the money to feed his cocaine addiction. Everyone wanted Trudeau gone. On March 24, 1985, there was a gathering in the clubhouse of the Sherbrooke chapter in Lennoxville. During that get-together, five members of the North chapter were murdered by gunfire, and then their bodies were placed in sleeping bags and thrown into the St. Lawrence River. The remaining individuals were integrated into the Montreal South chapter. The week before that meeting, Trudeau had engaged in a detoxification program, which prevented him from attending the gathering as planned. After some time, he said that he had decided to clean up his act because he had seen what happened to other members of the group who were usually high. Shortly after that, a delegate from the Montreal chapter paid a visit to Trudeau. Trudeau was told that he had been kicked out of the club and would be required to remove his club tattoos. However, Trudeau was well aware that he was operating on borrowed time. After learning that the Hells Angels had placed a bounty of $50,000 on his head, he decided to cooperate with law enforcement and give a testimony to the government. In 1985, Trudeau entered a guilty plea to 43 counts of manslaughter. The police estimated that 30 to 35 of his victims were either other motorcycle gang members or group sympathizers. Additionally, Trudeau provided testimony regarding 40 additional homicides and 15 attempted homicides. Trudeau was given a life sentence in jail, but he was eligible for parole in seven years due to his contentious deal with the government. As part of the agreement, the government would pay him $40,000 over the following four years and provide him with approximately $1.35 per week to spend on cigarettes. Huh, this guy. Trudeau was released from prison in 1994 and provided with a new identity. He masked his identity by adopting the name Dennis Cote, moving to the Valley Field region, resettling with a woman who was unaware of his history, and working at a nursing home and driving a bus for disabled people while he was there. However, following his termination from his job in 2000, he relapsed into his cocaine addiction and 2004, pled guilty to the sexual assault of a 13-year-old boy that he had committed after plying the youngster with wine and beer. He was given a prison term of four years as his punishment. He had killed more people in his lifetime than the Canadian military did while fighting in the Gulf War. When Trudeau returned to prison while carrying the twin stigma of having been a child molester and an informant, he was isolated for 24 hours every day. In 2006, Trudeau was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer. In July 2008, the Canadian National Parole Board decided to grant him parole and release him to a medical facility located outside of the country. However, he was not permitted to have contact with minors or other people even after his release from prison. You know what they say? A dying lion is till a lion. Or did I just make that up? However, cancer got to him first. That's all from this video. Do you think Trudeau really got to pay for his evils with his sentence? Share your thoughts in the comment section below and turn on that notification bell for instant updates on our new content. Until next time, stay safe. In the clandestine world of the Hells Angels, notorious for its dark mystique and criminal notoriety, a select few members have etched their names in the annals of infamy. These are the individuals whose actions have led them down a chilling path to death row, where they await the ultimate punishment for their deeds. Join us as we uncover the most groundbreaking death sentences imposed upon the most notorious Hells Angels, offering a glimpse into the harrowing world of one of the world's most feared motorcycle clubs.
These are the top 10 craziest Hells Angels death row reactions. Number one is Adam Lee Hall. Let's start with one of the most notorious and well-known criminals of the Hells Angels. Adam Lee Hall was among two others who all faced charges in the death of not one, not two, but three people out of Berkshire country back in 2011. He received three consecutive life sentences for the brutal triple murder in 2011. Berkshire County Judge C. Jeffrey Kinder described the case as displaying unimaginable cruelty and disregard for human dignity. One of the victims, called David Glasser, was supposed to testify against Hall. Then, all of a sudden, Glasser and his roommate Edward Frampton, together with their other friend Robert Chadwell, mysteriously disappeared. All of them belonged to the Pittsfield prosecutors and revealed during the process that Hall was a high-ranking member of the Hells Angels. He, together with North Adams and Caius Veovis, abducted the three victims and took their lives. Prosecutors said Hall kidnapped the three victims from Frampton's Pittsfield home sometime in the early hours of August 28, 2011, and fatally shot them. Their bodies were found later, about two weeks after the disappearance. They didn't just kill the men, they even dismembered their bodies. All defendants in this case were tried individually. During the trial, the judge sentenced Adam Lee Hall to three consecutive life terms for the brutal triple murder. The crime unfolded during Hall's sentencing as he tormented and abducted David Glasser, a vulnerable individual with a mental disability. Glasser's friends, Edward Frampton and Robert Chadwell, also fell victim to the heinous act due to their unfortunate presence. And as that is not enough, Judge Kinder also imposed two more consecutive sentences. Adam Lee Hall received 12 to 15 years behind bars for an armed robbery and another 8 to 10 years for kidnapping. The life sentence for the first-degree conviction is mandatory and has no possibility of parole. The Superior Court jury convicted Hall of all three deaths, together with 12 more crimes. During his trial, he showed no signs of remorse whatsoever. Number two is Dean Daniel Kelsey. Dean Kelsey, a member of the Hells Angels, was responsible for the tragic death of an innocent man in Dartmouth. In October 2000, he viciously assaulted Sean Simmons, a 31-year-old father of two from Lower Sackville, within the confines of a Trinity Avenue apartment building. Kelsey, along with three other individuals, faced charges related to Simmons' death. In March 2003, he was sentenced to life in prison for his involvement, a verdict that was subsequently downgraded to second-degree murder upon appeal. Kelsey had been in custody since his arrest in 2001. Two other men implicated in the case, Neil Smith and Wayne James, were also handed life sentences for their roles in the tragic demise of Sean Simmons. The group had been ordered to carry out the attack by a member of the Hells Angels due to allegations that Simmons had been involved with the mistress of a gang member from the Halifax chapter back in the early 90s. Although Kelsey had been convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and first-degree murder, his sentence saw increments in 2008 and once more in 2015 due to assaults on fellow inmates while incarcerated. The order for the attack had come from Hells Angel member Neil Smith. Regrettably, despite strong opposition from the victims, their families, and the prosecution, Kelsey was granted parole in 2019. His release to the disappointment of his victims, occurred after spending 18 years behind bars. Simmons's family expressed concerns that Kelsey's release might have been influenced by a parole board seeking to meet certain quotas. Kelsey's prior convictions encompassed a range of offenses, including assault causing bodily harm, uttering threats, mischief, robbery, obstruction of a peace officer, and narcotics trafficking. His actions behind bars, which included assaults on fellow inmates, further underscored the absence of remorse for his past actions. Number three, Zane Powra Wallace. Wallace, a Hell's Angel prospect, was responsible for a brutal assault that tragically claimed the life of a mother of two, 30-year-old Jasmine Tamara Wilson. The devastating incident occurred in August 2019, when Jasmine was found unconscious and severely injured abandoned outside the emergency department of Wanganui Hospital. Wallace's father, Steve, made the harrowing discovery after his son Zane had called him seeking assistance. 
In connection with Jasmine's case, Zane's mother, Leanne, and his sister, Stevie Lee Wallace, were also convicted and subsequently sentenced for their roles in attempting to obstruct justice. Zane appeared before Justice Francis Cook in the High Court in Wanganui to receive his sentence, facing multiple criminal charges. Jasmine's family and friends expressed profound guilt over her tragic death, revealing that she had endured months of violence inflicted by her then-partner Zane. One of her sisters lamented the permanent void left in her heart by Jasmine's loss, which would endure for eternity. In court, multiple family members of Jasmine spoke about the enduring shock, pain, and suffering they continued to experience years after her passing. They directed a message to Zane, stating, If you pose a threat to your family, walk away. Realize you don't want to be the person inflicting such harm on someone else's loved ones. Zane was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 15 years and 6 months for taking Jasmine's life. In addition to this, Zane had admitted to a range of other charges, including sending death threats to the victim's family and assaulting other individuals. Detective Senior Sergeant Neil Forlong revealed that Jasmine's injuries were among the most severe he had ever encountered. Wallace had pleaded guilty ahead of a retrial, as his initial trial had concluded in May 2021, following updates in medical evidence. He had previously confessed to assaulting Wilson on multiple occasions, including an incident that took place in the Wanganui Hells Angels Clubhouse in May 2019. Tensions ran high in the courtroom gallery, with confrontations between the Wilson and Wallace families as Wallace was escorted into the courthouse cells. Jasmine's family members vociferously expressed their anger towards Wallace, while police officers worked diligently to prevent any physical clashes. Wallace had a disturbing history of violence, with prior convictions for assaulting former partners dating back to 2014. In the nine months leading up to her tragic death, he had subjected Jasmine to repeated assaults. The fatal incident commenced with an argument between the two, followed by a brutal assault. Although she initially survived, Jasmine tragically succumbed to her injuries the following day. Number four is Emery Martin, widely known as Pitt, boasts a long-standing affiliation with the Hells Angels, making him a seasoned member of this notorious motorcycle club. He is a seasoned veteran of Quebec's violent and deadly biker conflict, known as the Biker War. Martin's legal woes stem from his involvement in the narcotics trade, resulting in a significant prison time accumulation. Of his 63 years on this planet, Martin has spent more than two decades behind bars. His Hells Angels membership exceeds 25 years. Initially, Martin confessed to being part of the Montreal chapter when he initiated his narcotics distribution operation. However, in November 2016, he switched allegiance to the New Brunswick Nomad chapter. His criminal activities caught up with him in October 2021, when he faced sentencing as a senior executive of a substantial interprovincial narcotics network. Martin was among the individuals apprehended in 2018 during Project J Thunderstruck, an investigation led by the RCMP targeting high-volume bulk drug trafficking from Quebec into New Brunswick. The court's judgment was clear. Without Martin's involvement, the illegal substance trade in the region would not have thrived. The presiding judge articulated this point, stating, his status as a member of the NB Hells Angels Nomad gave him the power to direct trafficking in the territory he controlled. The network without Mr. Martin's permission would not have been able to traffic on its territory. Following extensive pre-trial proceedings, Martin was slated for a four-month trial, but ultimately opted for a plea deal. He admitted guilt on two of his five charges, conspiracy to traffic and committing a crime for the benefit of a criminal organization. Martin played a pivotal role as the intermediary between the supplier of uncut narcotics in Quebec and a group of New Brunswick traffickers led by Marcel Friad. In exchange for this arrangement, Martin received a share of the profits generated from Friad's operation, collecting a tax on all their sales. His responsibilities were largely managerial, involving granting approval, introducing buyers to sellers, and addressing logistical issues associated with deliveries. Communication within the group was safeguarded through encrypted phones. Over the span of May 2016 to July 2017, 
This collective managed to move a staggering 96 kilograms of illegal substances. Although Martin was originally slated to serve an eight-year sentence, an assault incident during his prison term resulted in a reduction of six months from his incarceration period, as ordered by LeBlanc. Number five, Neil Cantrell and his gang Neil Cantrell, an established biker with a history in the motorcycle scene, emerged as a key figure in a 2016 extortion conspiracy, teaming up with his 38-year-old son Stephen and fellow Hells Angel member Robert Lowry. Cantrell was involved in a gruesome incident that resulted in the demise of an associate, an Alberta gang leader. Their victims also included a former BC associate who had distanced themselves from the illicit marijuana trade. Throughout the trial, BC Supreme Court Justice Ward Branch acknowledged Neil Cantrell's role as the mastermind behind the extortion scheme. The judge went further, asserting that Cantrell and his co-defendants deserved more severe sentences than what they ultimately received. In 2020, all three individuals were found guilty of charges including kidnapping, extortion, aggravated assault, and overcoming resistance, stemming from their brutal attack on Robert Houle. It's worth noting that Houle had previously served as Cantrell's right-hand man over a decade ago. In December 2014, Houle made the journey to Edmonton with the intention of informing his associates about his desire to exit the illegal business. In a significant gesture, he even offered his growing equipment to Cantrell. However, it wasn't until July 2016 that Neil Cantrell reached out to Houle, arranging a meeting. The following day, Houle arrived at a roadside pullout near Hope, only to be abruptly seized and subjected to a brutal assault. Subsequently, he was taken to his own residence, where the trio of convicts attempted to coerce him into signing over his property. RCMP officers intervened, and Houle was hospitalized due to the extensive injuries he sustained, including cuts, broken bones, and a burn on his forehead. The severity of the assault compelled Houle to seek refuge in the Witness Protection Program. Judge Branch, who, fearing for his life, departed from town, emphasized during the sentencing hearing that Cantrell displayed no remorse for his actions. Quoting from a report presented at the hearing, Judge Branch conveyed Cantrell's perspective. He stated he felt he was definitely owed some money and was certainly trying to get what was rightfully his. The subject feels bad the guy got hurt but should have known what was coming. This report indicated a complete absence of remorse on Cantrell's part. In this context, Neil Cantrell, who exercised control over his son and Lowry, the enforcer of their extortion scheme, received a 10-year prison sentence. Throughout the sentencing hearing, he maintained a composed demeanor, showing no emotional response and exhibiting no regrets for his role in the ordeal. Number 6. Norm Cox and Rob Thomas. Norman Cox and Robert Leonard Thomas held the status of full patch members within the Kilwana Hells Angels. In a tragic incident that unfolded in June 2011, these two individuals, along with four others, were responsible for the untimely demise of Dane Phillips, who was 51 years old at the time. Phillips, an unfortunate victim, had merely sought to peacefully mediate a dispute between his two sons and two teenagers associated with the Hells Angels Biker Club. Heartbreakingly, his own son bore witness to the brutal assault. The attack on Phillips was carried out with extreme brutality, as Thomas and Cox wielded a baseball bat and a hammer to strike him on the head. One of the four accused Hells Angels involved in this fatal attack was allegedly motivated by his gang connections, according to the prosecution. In his closing statements, Crown Counsel Joe Bello emphasized that the accused's hostility towards Phillips before the June 2011 assault was abundantly clear. Norman Cox and Robert Leonard Thomas both received a 15-year prison sentence for their role in Dane Phillips's tragic death. However, their sentences were reduced to 12 years after factoring in credit for time served in pre-sentence custody. During the sentencing, BC Supreme Court Associate Chief Justice described the assault as a ruthless and premeditated attack involving weapons on an unarmed man who had sought to mediate a dispute. Janine Phillips, the wife of the deceased, conveyed the impact of the loss in her victim impact statement. She described Dane Phillips as a warm-hearted presence and emphasized that his absence had created a profound void in their family. 
She expressed how he had been violently torn from their lives. Additionally, Janine recounted in court how she suffered a heart attack upon seeing her husband's lifeless and unrecognizable body in the hospital, stating, This is what makes it such a senseless crime. It's a mystery to us how these people even became involved in our lives. The confrontation between Phillips and his sons, Cody and Kaylin, and the group led by Thomas and Cox occurred on a public highway outside Kilawana. Thomas emerged from a pickup truck, brandishing a baseball bat in one hand and a ball-peen hammer in the other, repeatedly berating Phillips for his perceived transgressions against the Hell's Angels. Following the assault by Norman and Rob, the four Hell's Angels associates, including Robert Cox, now Norman Cox's father, Daniel and Matthew McRae and Anson Shell, allegedly continued the attack by kicking Phillips while he lay on the ground. Kilawana RCMP superintendent commented on the sentencing, expressing hope that these guilty pleas would provide some degree of closure for those who cared about Dane Phillips, despite the ongoing legal proceedings. Number 7. David Giles David Giles, a seasoned member of the Hell's Angels, found himself handed a staggering 18-year prison sentence in 2017, a record-setting punishment among BC members of the infamous Biker Gang, notorious for their involvement in criminal activities. His conviction stemmed from a prominent role in a conspiracy to smuggle a daunting half-ton of illegal substances, a transgression committed nearly five years before his trial. During the trial, Giles, who was then 66 years old and in poor health, struggled to breathe as he occupied the prisoner's box. It was within this tense atmosphere that BC Supreme Court Justice Ross justified the 18-year sentence, stating, Considering the nature of his illicit dealings, the sheer quantity of the contraband involved, the intent for it to be an ongoing enterprise, Mr. Giles' level of involvement, and his personal circumstances, I have determined that a fitting sentence is 18 years. Justice Ross also granted Giles nearly seven years credit for his time spent in pretrial custody, resulting in a net prison term of 11 years and one month. In the previous autumn, Giles had already faced conviction on charges of conspiracy to import illegal substances and conspiracy to traffic for trafficking purposes. He and his associate, Kevin Van Colleren, had brokered a smuggling deal in 2012 with individuals they believed to be South American suppliers but were, in fact, undercover police officers. Van Colleren also pleaded guilty on the day of his trial and was handed a 16-year sentence. The police had dedicated months to negotiations before finally apprehending Giles and Van Colleren, complete with a $4 million down payment and 200 kilograms of narcotics, all delivered to a Burnaby warehouse. Six additional individuals were also arrested alongside them. Giles's defense attorney, Paul Gill, argued for a reduced sentence, citing his client's critical illness due to liver disease, necessitating an urgent transplant. Gill contended that Van Colleren was the true mastermind behind the conspiracy, having provided the financial backing and introduced Giles to the undercover officer. While Judge Ross acknowledged the importance of considering Giles's health, she rejected the argument that he had played a subservient role to Van Colleren in orchestrating the substantial shipment. Ross asserted, once Mr. Giles was recruited into the conspiracy, he operated as Mr. Van Colleren's equal partner and was treated as such by Mr. Van Colleren. During the proceedings, it came to light that Giles held the position of vice president within the Hells Angels' Kiwana chapter. He openly discussed his ambitions, aiming to produce 500 kilograms of narcotics every three months, frequently referring to his market, distribution plan, and clientele. Prosecutor Chris Greenwood recommended a sentence ranging from 18 to 20 years for the ailing and balding Hell's Angel, contending that intercepted conversations provided clear evidence of Giles's substantial involvement in the trade for an extended period. Number 8. Stephen Sanders Stephen Sanders, a former president of a local chapter of the Hells Angels, found himself facing a severe legal ordeal back in 2013. At the age of 41, Stephen Sanders was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison, following convictions on multiple felony charges, including solicitation and kidnapping. 
Prosecutors presented evidence indicating that Sanders had confessed to kidnapping two individuals for the benefit of a criminal street gang. During the pendency of his case, Sanders took part in a disturbing plot to orchestrate assaults and even deaths against witnesses and law enforcement officers connected to his legal proceedings. He faced prosecution in several other cases brought forth by the district attorney's office. In 2012, he was found guilty of solicitation to commit murder, robbery, and assault with the intent to inflict serious bodily harm. In April and June of 2013, Sanders pleaded guilty to charges of assault with a deadly weapon, kidnapping, and gang-related allegations. Prior to his sentencing, Sanders sought to withdraw his guilty plea, a request that was ultimately denied by the San Diego Superior Court judge. His attempts to harm witnesses associated with the pending kidnapping and torture case significantly diminished his prospects for a more lenient sentence. During his sentencing, Sanders addressed the court, expressing reservations about his situation. He conveyed that he had felt pressured to enter a guilty plea, as a trial conviction could have resulted in a lengthy sentence. Despite admitting to his actions on record, Sanders vehemently refused to acknowledge the Hells Angels as a criminal street gang. His attorney also attempted to retract the guilty plea, but the motion met with denial. The district attorney's office regarded Sanders' sentencing as a significant victory for law enforcement. The DA emphasized the importance of his case, stating, In recent years, the defendant has engaged in a series of violent crimes against the citizens of San Diego. During the course of being prosecuted in a kidnapping and mayhem case, he conspired to take the lives of those who were key parts of a case against him. Our office dismantled his plans to have witnesses and law enforcement officers assaulted, holding him accountable for his actions. Number 9. Caius Veavis Adam Lee Hall wasn't the only one facing charges in trail of the triple murder. Caius Veavis, a man whose startling appearance and dark history are intertwined with charges of abducting and causing the tragic demise of three Hell's Angels, Veovis went to extraordinary lengths to cultivate an intimidating image, opting for horn implants on his head and a sinister 666 inches tattoo on his forehead. His hands are also tattooed, showing the bone structure. In addition to Veovis, two others, Adam Hall and David Chalu, also faced accusations related to these heinous crimes. Hall, a prominent figure within a Massachusetts Hells Angels chapter, confronted a litany of charges, including hijacking, assault, intimidation, extortion, and cocaine distribution. The victims in this tragic incident, David Glasser, Edward Frampton, and Robert Chadwell, found themselves ensnared in a harrowing ordeal. David Glasser, in particular, was targeted due to his potential role as a crucial witness against Hall. Despite Veavis strongly asserting his innocence during the sentencing proceedings and refusing to plead for leniency or engage in negotiations, he received three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, as mandated by the minimum penalty for first-degree offenses. This chilling case serves as a stark reminder of the perils that exist in our world. Despite the unsettling details, justice was served as these criminals confronted the consequences of their actions.